Speaking, a monthly podcast on the spoken word. Episode 9, October 2018, Accents and Dialects. Hello, Paul Meyer here with the latest podcast from Paul Meyer Dialect Services at paulmeyer.com. That's where you'll find all my books, ebooks, and services for spoken word training and coaching, from stage dialects to Shakespeare to corporate communication and accent training for non-actors. My guest this month is Jim Johnson, one of our associate editors on IDEA, who has made some unique contributions to the archive. Excellent samples from Houston, and he and I are the major contributors to one of IDEA's special collections, Play Names and Terms. Like me, Jim publishes books to teach actors how to do accents and backs them up with recordings of the real-life speakers he has recorded all over the world. And like me, he coaches actors in Shakespeare's original pronunciation. Professor Johnson is Director of Undergraduate Studies at the University of Houston School of Theatre and Dance. He works professionally as an actor, director, and voice and dialect coach. In 2007, he founded Accent Help and continues to develop accent training materials for the website. And each summer, Jim teaches and performs with the Prague Shakespeare Company. Jim has just returned from Prague, where he played the title role in Julius Caesar. Jim, thanks so much for joining me today. This is going to be great. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Thanks, Paul. It's been too long since we've had a little chat. You've been a, (laughs) a busy traveling man. You've been to Prague this summer. How was that? Oh, it was lovely. I, this was our third summer back in Prague, um, teaching and performing with the Prague Shakespeare Company uh, as a part of their summer uh, Shakespeare intensive. And it's just been incredible. It's wonderful, the people that we're getting to meet there, both the students and the, the faculty that are brought in. And, uh, and I just love the city of Prague. And you got uh, murdered uh, once nightly and twice on Fridays, right? Yes, and the students loved it. They got to kill me. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> Et tu brute. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> well, you and I have so much in common, uh, actors, directors, coaches, publishers of dialect um, help for actors. You are the champion of accent help, and and you are an even more prodigious collector of real-life dialect samples <laughs> than I am, but we, we both are share billets on idea. Talk about some of the places you've visited to collect your dialect samples. Well, the first time that I did a trip, it was to the UK, and I got to travel around a bit there back in 2003. And that was when I, I just began the idea, I guess. And then I started to spend more and more of my breaks going out, especially I love to travel and I love road trips. And so I do a lot of traveling. Um, I've had a number of camper vans. And so I've done a lot of traveling around the U.S. and up into Canada and a, a lot of those sort of driving tours, in addition to some time in other countries recording people there. And it also helps that I'm in Houston. So I'm in a, a city that's that's very international. So there are a lot of accents available here. And and nowadays with technology, I'm you know often getting hooked up with people online to be able to get dialect recordings that way. People do reach out to me as well. Why is it important? Would you say? I think you and I both know, but why is it important yeah. to collect these ways that people speak? Really, in the short term, it's actors need this because they need the reality of the way that it sounds. And it's one of the things that I say to people often when I'm introducing myself is I say, you know, I work with actors to try to help them sound more like they are genuinely from this place rather than a stereotype of it, especially for accents that are commonly disparaged in any way or marginalized. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think that another reason that it's really important, a number of years ago, I was in South Carolina and trying to pick up a few Gullah recordings of the, the accent right along the coast there. And one of the challenges is that it's dying out because the people who speak and spoke with the strongest of those accents they no longer live in isolation. Most of them, if for no other reason than all the money that's come in there, people, even though they've had some of the land for generations, now they have to go out and they have to work 
just to pay the taxes on the land, which has become really expensive, the, the accent's dying out. So this is a part of their culture. It's like the languages that are dying out around the world. I and do unless, think it's important for us to have those. And unless you and I and other like-minded people preserve them, they'll mm-hmm. be gone, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I find myself fascinated with them and the cultures behind them and, and what created them. So when when an actor does an accent, does a dialect, mm-hmm. um, that actor is doing so much more than just pasting on cosmetic sounds. They are embodying culture. To what, mm-hmm. ex- to what extent do you think values and worldviews and our views of reality and our views of ourselves are encoded in our dialects? Well, I certainly think there are expectations that people have because we constantly have stereotypes, stereotypes of what an accent sounds like and also stereotypes of what th- that kind of a person is if they speak that way. Beyond that, I'm not, I'm not sure really because I grew up in a very small town in Iowa. So I, I don't know that there's things that's in, that are inherent in me because I have belief systems that I had at that time that have shifted significantly from me getting out of that town and seeing more of the world and having more life experiences. So I don't know how much is encoded in it as much as how much is an indicator oftentimes. I mean, I think of the Americans, the American culture's ownership of space and time and own, owning mm-hmm. owning the sound. And there are always these this cliche of the of the loud American owning space yeah. and hail fellow well met and uh, and you go to, to smaller cultures Japan and and Britain mm-hmm. where there isn't so much space and and the way people use the language uh, reflects mm-hmm. perhaps at least their different allocation of the amount of space what do you think yeah i think that is true you know there are some folks who who use that as a part of teaching now to say oh this accent is this way because the land is very flat and broad mm-hmm. and i'm not convinced that that's true and that that's accurate but i don't care if it works right if it works for helping actors to be able to do it more accurately and and own it more Mm-hmm. I think it's great. I'm I'm a fan of any technique that has a payoff, whether there's any truth in it or not. <laughs> and how do you feel about this? That, as in all aspects of theatre and film, audiences come with a certain expectation of what the people look like, the pe- what the people sound like, what the places look like, sound like, feel like. And, and it seems to me, as theatre and film artists, we have an opportunity to do one of two things. We can pander to those expectations or we can challenge those expectations because I'm sure on your travels, I know I have, very often a person is a native of a particular place but they don't meet my cliche expectations of what people Mm -hmm. from those places sound like. Mm -hmm. So, so, so So what are the ethics of people who represent dialects and accents on film and in, th- in the theater in pandering to the expectation, playing the cliche versus um, going the other way and confounding the expectation because life is like that. And, you know, I think, I think it's a mixture of things and I think it depends on the production. My wife has done a couple of different productions of the Great American Trailer Park musical and there is definitely you know, stereotype that plays out in that. And there are elements of it that embrace that stereotype and elements of it that fight against it. But I think that sometimes you have to meet the audience's expectations so that they can come along with you on the journey and actually discover there's something more. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that there's a right answer for that. I think it can certainly vary between productions, uh, even of the same show. I just worked on a production of West Side Story this past year and the director was wanting to make a lot of choices way outside of the expectation, including some shifts in time period, costuming, and accents and dialects. And there are elements of that that can really help to open the show up. And then there are elements of it that can make it feel like, but wait a minute, if you said you're from this place and you don't sound like from there, now I as an audience member might be taken out of it and distracted by it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, I also have to say, 
I, I greatly appreciate the Disney stereotype in that it gives, it oftentimes I find helps actors to find something to grab onto for a place to start so that they can get that really strong stereotype of the accent and then start to own it. Mm-hmm. The, uh, I talk about it with my, my students that, that really, when I talk about an accent or a dialect, I'm taking a bunch of idiolects and I'm putting them in a category and then that's this broader accent or dialect. And then what we have to do is turn it back into an idiolect for you. Now, now, how does this play out for you and how do you own this? So I'm going to jump in and remind you that we're talking to a broader audience than, than just our yeah. theater friends. So idiolect is a term that some of our listeners may not have heard of. Unpack that for us. Yeah. Uh, the simple way I'd say it is the way that a person speaks. That um, certainly I, I have an elements of an Iowa accent or dialect, but that there are elements of that that have changed over time. And also the way I speak, even though I'm from a town of 900 people and I lived there all my life and my mother still lives there, or I still have a brother there, that I speak very differently than someone else in that town. There's huge varieties of ways that people speak there. And we would tend to categorize those all within some sort of a a title, but there are a lot of elements within that that vary from one person to another. Exactly. You took a a big swing through the Midwest and the South and found you ran into the dialect continuum, didn't you? That there is no hard line between those regions or those Mm -hmm. sounds and they kind of blur and meld into each other. Talk us, talk us through that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, this summer, this past summer, I, I spent about, I think it was six weeks on the road in my little camper driving around the primarily the Midwest and the upper Midwest and a little bit into Kentucky and West Virginia, uh, gathering about 130 or so recordings on that trip. I was surprised at how far south or how far north the southern switch of Penn Pin changed the the remember mention detention uh, denver that shift that sounded so foreign to me yeah as an iowan how far north that carried through much of kansas as you must be used to Mm -hmm. and and then hearing that a bit in some of those other states as well and then i was really enjoying one that i was sharing with you was driving down towards kentucky uh, from Indiana and making my way and that I was in one town and about 25 miles down the road, I stopped in another town and recorded a couple of people in both of those towns. And I had so clearly shifted from being in the Midwest to the South. <laughs> now, certainly there were elements that they have in common, but there were so many Southern elements that came up in that smaller, that other town. Let me play that for the for the listeners here. Yes, and I've, I mean, I've heard of, you know, music therapy degrees and art therapy degrees and things like that, but I think the animal side of it is something that hasn't really been evolved as much as the other two, so. We really get excited about a new business when we can get a new business to move in downtown. So, uh, it's sad. That's the sad part of changing times is that you lose those things. Just 25 miles apart. Yeah. And, and it, the towns felt very different as well. The, the one that was a little further south really embraced their southernness. And now I've lived in, in Texas, which some people say is the south and some people will argue that it's not. <laughs> but I've, I've, so I've lived in Texas now for 18 years, having grown up in the Midwest and then spending about 10 years in Chicago. I now look back and feel like the Midwest is sort of southern light in a lot of cultural elements. Because I do think that people's sense of identity has a big impact on the way they speak. So the who, who the they one, want to be, I mean, the identity absolutely. they wish to project. Yeah, absolutely. My brother-in-law, who married my my wife's sister, both he and his wife were from Lincoln, Nebraska, where my wife's from, and he has much more of a southern accent, and always had that, even though he went to a more expensive, sort of a higher money high school than the one that my wife and her sister went to. But he, for the longest time, even before he was done with high school, he saw himself becoming a trucker. So I think that he was living into that trucker identity long before he was. (laughs) So we 
to a greater extent than most people realize we we choose the accent that we embrace just i think just as we do with our parenting when you look back at your parents you might be either carrying on what they did or you might be living a life rejecting what you experienced there depending on on who that is or or the town that you're from and those sorts of things so yeah absolutely accent is a part of identity as well people's sense of self and you just touched on how very very quickly accents change i mean you and i are both exponents of shakespeare's original pronunciation i know you've coached a lot of that and and in prague too right yeah uh Um, first worked on it there two years ago and then last year david crystal and his son ben both came to prague shakes and and there was extensive work in that and most of the shows were done with uh, at least some of it done in OP. Wouldn't it be marvelous if we actually had recordings of the way the Elizabethans and Jacobeans sounded? You know, another one like that is that sense of what did Americans sound like around the time of the revolution. (laughs) That's one that I think fascinates a lot of people. And part of me really desperately wants those recordings, and then part of me, I have to admit, appreciates the unknown that we just can't know for sure, and so we have to guess. I think having to guess like that in many ways invites play. So I I also appreciate that. I think the revolutionary period is the biggest challenge culturally to us in terms of accents and dialects because, you, you know, you do something set in the revolution and the good guys are have got to got to sound American and 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 the, and the redcoats have got to sound British and with an accent that didn't mm-hmm. exist at the time. So we're, yeah. we're in a real a real mess with trying to portray creatively and uh, yeah. instructively the accents of of the revolutionary period. And so once again, for example, in the series Turn, where that they use they had to make that choice right from the beginning. You know, part of what I think they were doing was answering the audience's expectations so that that wasn't what distracted them. Then they could focus on the story. And yet dialect is a narrative tool. It's a storytelling device. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. when 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 I lapse into an accent of some kind, I'm already engaging in narrative, enriching the story. And one of the things that I love about teaching accents to my students, I think that it helps their acting because they have to shift and change who they are because taking on another accent isn't just changing the way you talk. As you alluded to earlier about there's a, there's cultural elements. They, there are things that they have to take on in order to embody that accent and believe themselves doing it. And yet the film and the play is never about the accent. In fact, our mm-hmm. profoundest wish as dialect coaches is that the audience, after about five minutes of the play or the film, kind of forgets about it. It's not in the fore- It should not be in the, in the foreground of their attention. Yeah, it's that idea that if dialects are mentioned in a review, it's usually bad. Mm-hmm. So it's better to, better to have nothing said whatsoever. <laughs> exactly. And that's that's frustrating. You you, you want your work to be mentioned. Uh, you want uh, the Oscar nominated actor to mention his dialect coach, and yet <laughs> and yet we want it to recede into the background. Very interesting. Going to play you a sample, like your take on it. It's 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 uh, an idea sample that I collected, and it's mm-hmm. going back to our Midwest Southern thing. My dad used to dig graves by hand. And then uh, when I got in the excavating business, why, uh, that that had been in 1970. And uh, they, uh, the old timers just didn't want to dig them by hand anymore. So the funeral home here at Oscaloosa called me and I dug old Ozark in. And the first thing you know, I was digging Perry and McLeod and all around and huh. and now we were up to 50 we've dug at 56 different cemeteries and we dig for five different undertakers well it's it's a business my dad always said if you uh do people a good job and and do an honest day's work why well, you'll never be out of work and he's sure right <laughs> i've never been out of work <laughs> since i went in business 
That's Kansas 4. Doesn't sound like hmm. Kansas somehow. Certainly not what someone would think of as Kansas. No. It's interesting how strong that is considering how much the accent can fade as you go further north in Oklahoma. How much that, that sort of Texas anchor as you drag it up through Oklahoma gets lighter and lighter. And I will say one thing that probably impacts it is he sounds like he's, he's quite a bit older. So, um, he's an, an older, older generation of, speaker. Yeah. He's 60. Yeah. At the time of the yeah. recording. Uh, so how far, how far north or south and east and west in Kansas? I would guess further south and further west. He's, a, no, that's the surprising thing. He's wow. a native of northeast Kansas. Oh, wow, just really? A few, just a few miles from Kansas City. Wow, not at all what I would expect. But not in a town. Yeah. You know, he's a very small village. Uh, shifting gears suddenly here. The art of sample gathering. Mm -hmm. This may be only of interest to you and me, but how do you get people to do their real accent and avoid code shifting to something more standard? You know, funnily enough, I was thinking during his conversation, the hard part with his conversation is I had a lot of trouble understanding what he was saying. So his recording, though it's interesting, there's there are elements about it that are not as useful for an actor. In some ways, I would have loved to have heard him feeling like he almost has to clean it up just a little bit for this outside ear. Does that make sense? Yes. That's what we usually have to do for the stage is we have to we not only have to, you know, perhaps if we're trying to be very clear about location, we have to portray location clearly, but we also have to be fully understandable. And yes. if we lose that, we lose the story and therefore the accent's actually getting in the way. There are elements about it that, that it's good to have them clean it up just a little bit. Yeah. Well, maybe that's the actor's job. That There's that old cliche of that if you go to go to London and get in a cab, you won't understand the Cockney cabby driver at all. Mm -hmm. And yet, you, how do you play that on film without, um, without being yeah. untrue to it? I guess that's why we call it an art and not a science somehow. What happens to your speech when you go back home to Iowa? Oh, it definitely, it definitely kind of drops back and it goes a little bit back in my mouth. Absolutely. I was back home at the beginning of May and my sister-in-law, Diane, insisted that she doesn't have an accent. And, uh, uh, so Diane and I were back and forth about that the whole weekend. And I definitely drift back there when I'm there. And I, on my trip this summer, when I was up further north up in the UP, the upper peninsula of, of, uh, Michigan, I would definitely start drifting in that direction. It, you know, if you're within within a culture of any kind and, and you don't make a shift, you, it's 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 interesting to me when people don't. I yeah. know. It, I was talking about that with David Crystal on an earlier podcast. Why do mm. we um, accommodate pragmatically yeah. to other people's? Um, and what, what what do you learn about someone who doesn't accommodate and, and code yeah. shift? Well, I always use Obama and and uh, Bush as examples of that in that Bush, by some people, was respected because he didn't shift, depending on who he talked with. He didn't shift very much. And Obama did make more significant shifts. And some people respected him for that because he would connect to audience, and some people would say that he was fake. And so there are certainly perceptions. It's a challenge because I think if you do that in your daily life, it will tend to serve you pretty well. But then if you're exposed to mass media where you have this diverse audience coming from all these different perspectives and places, they might judge it differently. I've been a bit of a chameleon in my life. I was, I was um, brought up in Hampshire in, in southern England mm -hmm. and, and with the rich vowels that you hear me doing now. So I was a Hampshire lad, a country boy, you know, British equivalent of, of a southern accent, I suppose you'd say. Mm -hmm. And... Um, but yet my, and that, and that was the speech of my grandparents. But my mother, of course, a, a child of that culture, was a grammar school girl and had aspirations to leave that milieu. And so gravitated much more towards standard British English to RP and wanted that mm -hmm. for her children. But then we moved to London and I was in a working class neighborhood of London. And in order to avoid getting beaten up on the playground, I, uh, I stopped my I stopped my 
country cousin accent and uh, you know I started to do the South London accent and I've never known quite what to think of myself am I a coward for not declaring who <laughs> I am or am I paying a compliment to my, mm-hmm. my surroundings and accommodating to that so how do you feel about yourself in in the in your own code shifting from Iowa to mainstream and to the upper per- peninsula of of Michigan when you go there what do you think you, yeah you, well in in the end, uh, in the end, live a good life, and then who gives a damn? <laughs> <laughs> you know, if, if I'm doing it for malicious reasons, then it's more problematic. But if I'm I'm doing it to connect with people, that's one of the great glories of life. So, I'm all for the adaptation. You, I don't think you gain a whole lot from holding on to your supposed integrity and then be beaten up on the playground. <laughs> I, th- I think you're gaining a lot more by probably participating in the community rather than rejecting it. So I wouldn't call it cowardice. I would call it life. <laughs> thank, you. thank you, Jim. <laughs> Absolutely. That's... I judge you not, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Switching gears again, a story. An American director once asked me when he was directing me in an American role, I had a, you know an even stronger British accent at that time. He asked me, can you lose the accent? <laughs> As if it seemed to me that if I shed my British accent, what would lie underneath? But of course, an American accent. Of course, naked Paul is American underneath all yeah. that, all that uh, dialectical clothing. <laughs> but a, a British director to an American actor would never say, can you lose the accent? It seems to me mm-hmm. they would always say, can you do a British accent? Yeah. So yeah. my question to you is, do have you encountered in your, in your globetrotting dialect gathering activities, have you encountered different attitudes towards accents in the cultures you visit? I don't feel like I've encountered it so much in different cultures even though this is what i do i don't think that comes up as much the idea of the only way that they'll talk about it is to is i want to lose my accent people will say that but they're primarily talking about that as esl speakers Mm -hmm. and then maybe we come back around to oh you want to make your accent not get in the way of communicating Mm -hmm. um where i will say that i do feel like i hear that a decent bit is in the rehearsal room or in the process that different people will speak of it differently. And it's, it's primarily degrees of ignorance of, of not knowing how to speak about that. And at the same time, I don't necessarily judge the director for giving that note because they're speaking something. And then part of, part of your job as an actor is then to interpret that and go, Oh, okay. He means this. Mm-hmm. Um, ideally the director would understand that better because then they might, might sympathize further uh, it's the response I want to make to directors sometimes of saying when they when they say something about can you fix his accent or can you work can you do something about that that I want to say well when you fix his acting I'll fix his accent. <laughs> <laughs> nice response. <laughs> so often there I, oh I don't say that response I do not say that response but so often they're so closely tied. Yes. So I just think it's it's the it's the only vocabulary that they have have learned for expressing it. They haven't learned a further vocabulary. It's always a sad thing to me when a client comes to me who, who wants so-called accent reduction. Again, mm-hmm. that, that's a misnomer entirely. It's they, they want to be trained in another accent so they can become bi-dialectal or whatever. Mm-hmm. But yet they say, can you fix my accent? Uh, I know I, t- I, speak, yeah. I speak terribly and it's holding me back in business and socially and and nearly always I tell them, it's a tremendous shame that you think and speak in that way about your own culture, about your own accent, because to me, I love it. Yeah, I think it's the reality that we're in. But I, one of the things that I feel like I can do once in a while is in speaking with people, sometimes they feel like, wait a minute, somebody actually values the way I'm speaking and, and you're not here to mock me? And I think that sometimes we can both walk away from that being richer people because we had that experience with each other. Exactly. So let's, let's finish up by talking about 
how important our work is. Why not? Let's, <laughs> let's toot our own Let's just be self-important, if nothing let's else. Be self-important. I think our work as dialect coaches is important in order to convey the idea to audiences that their own culture is just one among many and that a dialect is not simply something for fun, simply not something to be quaint or cute or interesting, but it's just one more culture among many. So in, in a sense, we are in the vanguard of that quest for promoting the respect and validation, respect for and validation of other cultures. I think potentially we are. And I think with what, what we do with the gathering without the purpose to denigrate, I think that's accurate. I think it's possible as a coach that you could not be holding them up for positive praise. Um, you could be involved in some things that, that would be negative with regards to an accent and a people. But, um, but I think with good intentions, with, which I think almost all, all of us have heading into this, I think it can be very much about helping people to get a window into another world. And, you know, whether they have a passport or not, this is an opportunity for them to travel into another culture. You know, Jim, that sounds like a very hopeful way to wrap things up today. Thanks so much, Jim. Thanks, Paul. And thanks for joining me, Paul Meyer. Jim Johnson was my guest on this podcast. Go to AccentHelp.com to access his excellent dialect teaching material and hundreds of dialect sample recordings. And go to DialectsArchive.com to hear his contributions to IDEA. As always, please go to PaulMeyer.com for more of my podcasts, my books on accents and dialects, free Shakespeare material, interactive IPA charts, and voiceover information. Join me next time when I will be re-examining that old adage, it's not what you say, but the way that you say it. Next time on In a Manner of Speaking.